Welcome. Um, our goal today is to discuss the bonding of coordination complexes. Uh, the required readings are in Chapter 10. I would uh, strongly suggest that you read through Chapter 10.3 uh, and 10.5 uh, if you cannot finish every, everything in Chapter 10. Our objectives today are the following. First of all, we're going to discuss uh, MO diagram for ML6 complexes. Uh, those are the octahedral structures. We're going to talk about um, ligand field theory. We're going to discuss uh, how uh, the MO diagram can be constructed by considering only sigma bonding and also um, both sigma and pi bonding, uh, two major scenarios. After that, we're going to discuss electronic configuration, uh, how to fill electrons into the MO diagram. Um, and, um, and then there will be consequences of the electronic configuration, that including the total spin of the complex, uh, a new concept called ligand field stabilization energy, and uh, a related concept called uh, spectrochemical series. And finally, we're going to talk about the young Taylor effect. Uh, we're going to discuss the origin of this effect and uh, its impact on the MO diagram. All right. Um, so uh, let's get started. Um, the slide here shows the basic idea of constructing an MO diagram for ML6 complex. Uh, this is a very complex molecule, so uh, we're going to focus on the simplest scenario for now. And uh, the assumptions are the following. Now, each ligand um, uh, uses a lone pair to uh, interact with the metal, and there will be six ligands. They uh, form a OH uh, geometry, so octahedral um, complex. And the, uh, the metals can use a number of different uh, orbitals to interact with the, uh, to interact with the uh, ligand. Uh, in the simplest case, we're going to consider only the d orbitals. Uh, but you will see we can also include s and p orbitals uh, of, the, of the metal. Um, but that's not going to significantly change the MO diagram. What makes this situation complicated is that we have six uh, ligand orbitals. Uh, so this is very different from uh, the diatomic molecule case uh, that we discussed a long time ago. In that case, we can use the atomic orbitals of the two atoms to directly interact with each other and finding symmetry matching pairs. In this case, uh, that is not going to work out mathematically. Uh, instead, uh, th this the group theory, which we did not discuss in details in this class, the group theory requires that we're going to use a so-called group orbitals, uh, which is essentially a linear combination of the p orbitals to interact with the d orbitals of the metal. Okay. Uh, the group orbitals um, uh, produced by the six ligand um, orbitals are the following. Uh, they are shown on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, you'll find their shape and their symmetry. Okay, so there are three linear combinations. Um, they call T1U. Um, essentially, they have the so-called T1U symmetry. You may recognize that their symmetry matches that of the p orbitals. There are three p orbitals, uh, px, py, and pz. You'll find each uh, one of the T1U uh, linear combinations matches the symmetry of one of, one of those uh, p orbitals. Uh, there are two linear combinations having the so-called EG symmetry. Um, uh, of the two, you'll find uh, the one on the left matches the symmetry of the DZ square orbitals in that along the z-axis uh, there's one sign and uh, along the xy direction there's a different sign. The other EG, uh, EG linear combination matches the symmetry of dx squared minus y squared. Uh, as you will see, uh, along the x and y axis, uh, there are two uh, they're opposing opposite signs, um, but along the same axis, the signs are the same. 
And the last linear combination has uh, the A1G symmetry, uh, which is totally symmetrical with respect to all the symmetry operations of OH point group. And here, um, you may notice that this linear combination matches the symmetry of, uh, of S octors. Okay. All right, now we talk about the uh, symmetry of uh, the ligand orbitals. Uh, we have to talk about the symmetry of the d orbitals. Okay. The d orbitals within uh, within a framework of OH complex uh, has two different symmetries. Okay. There's an EG, which include a dx squared minus y squared and also dz squared. And uh, the other three orbitals, dxy, dyz, and dxz, uh, they have the so-called T2G symmetry. Okay. Now you may notice that um, the uh, two of the d orbitals, the two having EG symmetry, uh, they have symmetry matching pairs on the ligand side. But the T2G symmetry d orbitals do not have symmetry matching pairs on the ligand side. Okay. Similarly, if we only consider interaction between ligand and the d orbitals of the metal, then the T1U group orbital will not have any symmetry matching pairs, and the A1G orbital will not have any symmetry matching, matching pairs. All right, uh, now let's look at the MO diagram. Uh, this is the simplest case possible, um, in which we only consider the interaction between sigma donor ligands and uh, interacting with D orbitals of the metal. As we have uh, discussed previously, um, there are two different kinds of symmetries um, for the d orbitals, eg and t2g. On the right-hand side, uh, you find six different group orbitals. One has a1g symmetry, three has t1u symmetry, and one has uh, two has uh, two have eg symmetry. You also notice that uh, the orbital energy of the ligand is lower than that of the d orbital of the metal. That's expected um, because uh, the ligands are usually um, oxygen, fluorine, those are, uh, those are atoms with higher ionization energy. Okay, so their orbital energy should be a bit lower than that of metal, which often has lower ionization energy. All right, uh, so what you can do next is to form symmetry, uh, find symmetry matching pairs, and those um, orbitals will interact with, to form bonding and antibonding orbitals. And anything else, okay, those orbitals that do not have symmetry matching pairs will become non-bonding. Okay? So what end up in the middle is the MO diagram for the ML6 complex, and you'll find that there's uh, um, two orbitals uh, having EG symmetry, they are bonding, and there's also a associated anti-bonding EG star levels uh, at, at very high energy, uh, at very high energy level. In the middle uh, are non-bonding orbitals. Okay? So for the ligand, the T1U and A1G, because they do not find any symmetry matching pairs on the metal side, they become non-bonding. Uh, on the metal side, the T2G become non-bonding, again, because there's no orbitals uh, on the ligand side having T2G symmetry. Okay. Um, so effectively, uh, when you fill in electrons, okay, you'll realize that all the uh, ligands, okay, each ligand orbitals, they come in with uh, a lone pair, so that means two electrons on each orbital. On the metal, there's, uh, there will be a varying amount of uh, d electrons on the metal side. Okay? But when you fill in the electrons into the MO diagram, you notice that uh, the, the lowest six orbitals uh, are EG, T1U, and A1G. So there will be six of them. And those six uh, MO energy, uh, MO orbitals, okay? molecular orbitals, will accommodate exactly 12 electrons. Okay? And the ligand, as you may recall, will provide 12 electrons to begin with. Okay? So effectively, all the electrons in the ligand will be filled into 
the bonding and the, uh, the bonding EG orbital and the non-bonding T1U and A1G orbital. The remaining electrons in the metal will be populated onto the T2G and EG star levels. And you may notice there's a delta O sign here, and this indicates the energy splitting between the EG star and T2G. We're going to talk more about this uh, delta O um, uh, in later slides. Okay, so we just discussed the simplest case uh, in which we only consider the interaction of ligand uh, orbitals with d orbitals of the metal. Okay. Now, in reality, uh, the metal also has other um, other orbitals that can interact with the uh, with the ligand, and most likely this is the ns orbital and np orbital. So the d orbital is usually n minus one shell. So uh, what you have is n minus one d, ns and np. Uh, now I uh, I mentioned previously that the s orbital has a1g symmetry and the p orbital has t1u symmetry. Okay, so once you include these two orbitals, uh, you will find symmetry matching pairs on the ligand side because the ligand has a1g uh, group orbital and also t1u group orbital. So uh, what's going to happen is. Uh, these group orbitals will interact with the S and P orbitals of the metal and forming additional bonding and anti-bonding orbitals. And they will become A1G bonding, T1U bonding, A1G star anti-bonding, and T1U star anti-bonding. However, if you think about the, uh, the, the effect of this, uh, uh, this change on the electron filling, you'll find out that there's basically no, no, no impact on, uh, on the electronic configuration. Why? Because, again, on the ligand side, the, ligand brings, uh, the ligands bring in 12 electrons, and those 12 electrons will again be populated onto the A1G, EG, and T1U orbitals of the complex. And there are, again, exactly six orbitals there. So those six orbitals will consume the 12 electrons are brought in by the metal, uh, sorry, brought in by the ligand. On the, on the metal side, um, whatever number of electrons brought in by the, uh, by the metal will again be populated onto the T2G and EG star level. Um, in those transition metals, there's, there's always no S electron and there's always no p electron left in those transition metal ions. There's always only d electron um, when you when you consider uh, basically any transition metal ion. All right. So basically, uh, once you consider the effect of s and p orbitals, you're going to change uh, the MO diagram slightly by produ producing more bonding and anti-bonding orbitals. But the essential structure of the diagram is not going to change. You still have EG star and T2G levels, and the T2G levels uh, are essentially uh, the d orbital from uh, from the metal. Uh, those are dxy, dyz, and dxz orbitals. The EG star orbitals uh, are coming mostly from the metal because its energy is closer to that of the d orbital of the metal. So EG star levels have a lot of metal character, uh, and mostly dz square and dx square minus y square characters. All right, let's make things even more complicated. Um, now this diagram uh, is different from the previous one in that it includes uh, pi orbitals on the ligand side. So in this case, the ligand um, brings in both sigma and pi orbitals. And you may notice that there are uh, a total of 12 um, linear combinations of pi star orbital on the ligand side. Um, this is usually the case because uh, if you consider the example of, for example, fluoride or chloride, 
um, those atoms can use one um, lone pair, which is uh, located in one of its PR plus um, as a sigma donor. In addition to that sigma lone pair, it also has two pi lone pairs because it has three, basically three lone pairs located on the on the PR plus. And those uh, two additional uh, uh, p orbitals will form pi type interaction with the metal. And there will be a total of 12 those uh, pi orbitals to interact with the metal. And those 12 pi orbitals will form uh, 12 linear combinations. And 3 has T2U symmetry, 3 has T1U symmetry, 3 has T2G symmetry, and 3 has T1G symmetry. Now the most important thing here is that there is a linear combination of T2G and you may recognize that it matches the symmetry of uh, three D orbitals. Okay. Now the effect of having T2G is that it's going to have interaction with the T2G uh, orbitals of the metal and that's going to form bonding and anti-bonding orbitals, both having T2G symmetry. Now the net effect is that it's going to push down uh, the T2G level. So originally the T2G level is non-bonding, but now it becomes bonding. And the effect of that is that the delta value is going to increase. Okay. Um, keep this in mind. All right, uh, in this diagram, it shows uh, a bit simplified uh, version of the previous um, uh, diagram. In the middle, it shows uh, the EG star and the T2G levels of uh, ML6 complex when we only consider sigma bond interaction. On the left hand side uh, is essentially what we discussed in the previous slide, uh, where we have um, pi orbitals, and those orbitals are not filled with any electrons. And those uh, orbitals are um, are at very high energy levels, and those are so-called pi acceptors. Um, so those are basically um, ligands that have empty pi orbitals, and they can accept electrons into those pi orbitals. As we discussed before, the effect of having those pi acceptor ligands is that the T2G linear combination from the ligand is going to interact with the T2G level of the metal and that's going to push down the T2G level. Okay. And as a result of that, uh, delta will increase. On the right hand side is a different scenario. Um, the basic situations are still the same. The only exception is that um, the pi orbitals are now at much lower energy level and those pi orbitals are also filled with electrons. Okay, so essentially, the ligands have pi uh, orbitals that are completely filled, and those pi um, orbitals can donate electrons. Now the situation is slightly different in that uh, because the energy level of the uh, uh, pi orbital of the ligand is actually lower than the T2G level of the metal, it's still going to form uh, bonding and anti-bonding T2G levels. But in this case, the T2G bonding level is really, really low. It's even lower uh, than the, uh, than the uh, T2G level of the ligand. It also produces a T2G star level. And this level is going to be higher than the original T2G level of the metal. Now, when you fill in electrons, now the difference between the, uh, this case and the previous case is that the pi orbitals are, um, are filled with uh, electrons to begin with. So the ligand now brings, uh, brings in additional electrons. Those additional electrons on the, D or on the pi orbitals will be filled onto the T2G, uh, the newly formed T2G bonding levels. The remaining electrons on the metal uh, shown here are three electrons on the D, on the D, on the D levels, will be populated onto the T2G star levels. Okay, so basically, the new T2G star level um, 
uh, represents the old T2G level because the, uh, the new T2G star level has a lot of metal character. So now the delta becomes the energy difference between EG star level and the T2G, uh, T2G star level. So the net effect is that having a pi donor ligand uh, decreases delta value. All right, now once we have the ammo diagram, we can fill electrons. As we discussed before, um, all the electrons brought in by the ligands will be filled uh, in the uh, bonding orbitals. Um, whatever um, electrons um, brought in by the metal will effectively be populated onto the T2G and EG star levels. All right, now um, recall for electron filling, um, electrons definitely prefer lower energy levels, but also electrons would prefer to be uh, away from each other because electrons are negatively charged. So if they are far away from each other in space, uh, then the overall energy of the system will be lowered. Okay. Now, um, what that means is electrons would uh, like to fill into different orbitals if possible because different orbitals occupies different area in the space. And if you want to put two electrons into the same orbital, uh, there will be energy penalty because of the electron-electron repulsion. All right, so now uh, if we think about what's gonna happen when we put one electrons, one d, orb d orbital electrons into the, uh, into the T2G and EG star levels, uh, it's very simple. It's definitely gonna go to the T2G level. If you put in two, it's still gonna go to uh, T2G level, but in a different orbital. And those two electrons should uh, share the same spin because maximizing spin is preferred in terms of lowering the system's overall energy level. Uh, if you put the third one, it's still gonna be the same situation. Um, the three electrons can occupy three different orbitals in the T2G level. Uh, what's going to be complicated is when, when you bring in the fourth electron. Now the fourth electron has two options. It can either occupy uh, the lower T2G level and share in one orbital uh, with one existing electron, or it can occupy one of the uh, EG star levels. Okay. There will be energy penalties in both cases. The EG star level is, uh, is higher in energy, but um, sharing one uh, T2G, level, T2G uh, orbital with the existing electron also carries energy penalty due to electron-electron repulsion. Now, the question in this case is which energy penalty is larger? Now, if the delta value is really big, uh, that means the electron will more likely to prefer to stay at the lower uh, T2G level. If the delta value is small, uh, then it makes more sense for the electron to be populated onto the uh, EG star level to avoid electron-electron repulsion energy penalty. Okay. So those are the two different situations. Um, they are called high spin and low spin. Um, the high spin happens when the delta value is small, and as a result, the electron gets populated onto the EG star level, and the four electrons now share the same spin. In the other situation, which is called low spin, the electron stays at, EG, uh, uh, at T2G level and, um, and takes a different spin because uh, it's sharing uh, one uh, T2G orbital with the existing electron. If you compare the, those two scenarios, you'll find the total spin of the system for the high spin case is indeed uh, having higher spin than the low spin case. Okay. Now, um, you can keep adding electrons into the system and you will be faced with the same kind of question uh, and the answers are always the following, in that in a high spin case, uh, which is small delta, electrons will always prefer to be populated 
onto the higher EG star level and maximizing the system spin. In the low spin case, the electron would prefer to stay in the T2G level if possible, and the overall spin of the system will be lower. Now, uh, the high spin and low spin system uh, will show different electronic configuration uh, in D4, D5, D6, and D7 uh, ions. And keep in mind, those are the number of D electrons in the ion, not in the metal. All right, let's move on to discuss another concept called ligand field stabilization energy, uh, often called LFSE. This is a, a term used to describe uh, the energy gain or penalty upon the formation of a transition metal complex. The idea is the following. In the, um, uh, in the transition metal ion, before any complex is formed, all the five d orbitals are, um, are of the same energy. However, once the uh, complex is formed, as we have shown in the MO diagram, the five d orbitals essentially split into two levels, um, a T2g level having three orbitals, and EG star level having two orbitals. And in addition to that, uh, the electrons on the ligand uh, also uh, lowers their energies because now they reside in uh, the bonding orbitals uh, of the ML6 complex. So uh, the situation is really complicated, um, but we can use a pretty simple model to describe uh, those effects. Uh, that is shown on the left side of the slide. Uh, basically, you look at the uh, energy change of the d orbitals only, uh, and uh, the T2g levels uh, can be lowered by uh, two-fifths uh, of delta uh, relative to the original uh, d level and the EG star levels are, um, are in, increased by three-fifths uh, of delta relative to the original D value. So um, uh, in this model, uh, if you have one D electron in the, uh, in the metal, after forming a complex, uh, that one D electron will be uh, lowered by two-fifths uh, of delta. And you've got two d electrons will be lowered by uh, four fifths of delta, so on and so forth. So you can basically calculate the energy gain um, of forming uh, the complex um, based on the particular electronic configuration of the complex itself. Uh, on the right hand side shows uh, basically experimental verification of uh, of this LFSE idea. Um, Let's look at uh, the, the curve on the top. Uh, so there are two parts of the curve. One is uh, uh, this dotted line, blue uh, green dotted line from calcium to magnesium to zinc. This is the predicted uh, hydration uh, energy of those ions, of the transition metal ions, based on their radius and charge. And you should expect a gradual increase uh, in the uh, hydration energy because all those ions can carry two plus charges and their size gradually decrease as you move from left to the right side of the periodic table. So as you decrease the size, you're going uh, you're gonna increase the, uh, the charge density and that should increase the interaction between the metal and water. Uh, the black dot line shows the uh, experimental measure value and you will see that uh, there's a dramatic deviation from the theoretical prediction uh, when you have uh, especially when you have three uh, uh, d electrons four d electrons but the prediction is um, matches with the experimental value very well uh, with uh, when you have five d electrons uh, what happens uh, here is that this is an aqueous ion. Uh, this is a high spin case. So once you populate five d electrons uh, using the model on the left, you realize that those five d electrons uh, will be populated onto all five orbitals. And the LFSC value for d5 case is exactly zero. 
Now, once you move to d6, uh, the Rn2 plus, you start to, uh, to gain additional LFSE. And that happens for uh, all the uh, remaining cases until you get to uh, d10 when you populate all d electrons, uh, both eg star and the t2g, and the overall LFSE value becomes zero again. A related concept is called spectral chemical series. Uh, this is a very simple idea. Uh, basically, um, what we have discussed so far tells us that the delta value is a function of the nature of the ligand. Uh, we talk about sig sigma donor only, and we showed that pi acceptor ligands uh, increases delta, and pi donor ligands decrease uh, delta. Uh, so if experimentally we can measure delta by uh, measuring the, uh, the peaks uh, in the UV-vis uh, spectrum that is responsible for the DD transition, D to D transition. So those are basically transition from uh, T2G level to EG star level. And from those, you can calculate delta, uh, delta value. And, um, and you can rank um, ligands uh, based on their ability to um, increase or decrease delta value. So uh, in this series, on the left uh, are pi acceptor ligands, and those ligands produce the largest delta. On the right uh, are pi donor ligands, and those donors um, produce the smallest delta value. Uh, this is a very useful um, uh, data point, and I highly recommend uh, you remember as many uh, data points in this series as possible. Um, if you cannot remember all of them, at least um, remember where cyanide is, uh, where uh, ammonia is, where water is, where uh, fluoride, hydroxide, chloride uh, are located. Our last concept is uh, Jan Teller effect. Uh, this is um, a modification of, uh, of the MO diagram we discussed. Uh, the modification is the following. Uh, if you start from the uh, ideal octahedral geometry, and you're going to uh, distort the structure by doing one of the following two um, operations. In one, you can pull two ligands, let's say the top and bottom one, away from the metal. Okay? And at the same time, you're going to compress the other four a bit closer to the metal. So that is the structure distortion shown in this slide. Okay? A question you can ask yourself is, what's going to happen to the electronic structure? Now, you can answer the question by analyzing uh, the interaction between the ligand orbitals with the d orbitals of the metal. Okay. If you look at this uh, two group orbitals shown here, uh, the one on the left is going to interact with the dz square orbital of the metal because they have the same symmetry. The one on the right is going to interact with dx square minus y square metal, uh, orbital of the metal. Okay. Now, what happens when you pull the top and the bottom orbital away from the metal and at the same time move the other four a bit closer to the metal? Now what's going to happen is uh, the orbital, that's the group orbital that's going to interact with dx squared minus y squared is going to have stronger interaction. And the one that's going to interact with dz squared is going to have a weaker interaction because uh, the electron density of d z squared uh, are populated along the z-axis. So if you pull the two ligands away from the metal along the z-axis, their interaction with the d z squared orbital is going to be a lot weaker. And for the same reason, because the four ligands are moved closer to the metal along the x and y-axis, their interaction with uh, dx squared minus y squared is going to be a lot stronger. Okay. So what's going to happen to the MO diagram, uh, MO diagram's energy levels? Now, because the EG star levels are anti-bonding, having stronger interaction will push the energy level up. 
and having weaker interaction will uh, push the energy level down. And that's because a stronger interaction will produce a larger bonding, anti-bonding gap, and weaker interaction will produce smaller bonding, anti-bonding gap. So the overall effect is that the EG, EG star level originally degenerated in energy will uh, become two levels, a uh, dz square level that is lower in energy and dx square minus y square level that is slightly higher in energy compared to the original EG star. Okay. Now, why you may wonder why the uh, molecule would, uh, would undergo the, uh, the young teller distortion. Uh, the answer is pretty simple because um, by having this distortion, the system will benefit in terms of energy. Okay, so the, again, the, uh, the part highlighted by the red box shows one of those situations. Uh, this is a situation where EG star level uh, is populated with three uh, electrons. Now, um, keep in mind, there's also T2G level underneath, uh, and the T2G level in this case will be populated by six electrons. So this is a D9 system. Now, having this distortion will lower the energy level of two uh, electrons on the DZ square level, and at the cost of increasing the energy uh, of the electrons in the DX square minus Y square level. But overall, having this distortion will lower the system's overall energy, um, will lower two and increase one. So overall, it's a gain. All right, so uh, we discussed one type of distortion. Uh, there's another distortion that is exactly the opposite of what we already discussed. Uh, that is uh, having two ligands, uh, let's say the two on the Z axis, uh, being pushed closer to the metal, and the other four on the X and Y axis uh, being put slightly away from the metal. Uh, and I'll leave the analysis uh, of, of the MO diagram uh, to you. That's essentially shown on the right side of the uh, of the red box. All right, um, so we have uh, discussed quite a lot of things today, uh, and uh, here are a short list of my expectations for this chapter. Uh, I expect uh, everybody to uh, reproduce the MO diagrams uh, for ML6 complexes. Uh, this include uh, all kinds of scenarios, uh, sigma bonding only. Sigma plus pi, um, considering only the d orbital of the metal, or including d, s, and p orbitals of the metal. In any of those cases, you should be able to fill in electrons um, into the MO diagram, and based on the electron filling pattern, uh, to calculate uh, ligand field stabilization energy. And finally, uh, I expect you to understand uh, the electronic structure origin uh, of uh, Jan Teller. Uh, effect and the entire distortion and based on this um, uh, understanding to make correct predictions uh, for example whether the entire distortion would occur and if it does uh, what is the impact uh, and effect of uh, of the energy levels of the uh, MO diagram and that will be all and uh, I'll see you on Wednesday